Okay. Um, so I guess now we can um, get back to our discussion and continue actually to explore um, illusions, failures, nostalgia, or other features that we've been exploring up to now in, um, in Latin America. And um, we'll be looking at what you, that's part of the, the lexicon that is enriching, thanks to you, with the fiasco now of uh, the Mercosur, um, in particular the I mean, uh, tribunal, and in particular, uh, with a particular focus on um, the advisory uh, opinion. And um, what I think is very interesting in, in your uh, uh, presentation uh, is, is the, the controversy, the legal controversy and political controversy over the legal value of this, uh, these advisory opinions uh, to uh, the tribunal of the Mercosur, also because it brings us back to, uh, and, and the actors themselves of that controversy, use the lessons um, uh, from uh, maybe the successes and failures, depending on which stand, uh, point, standpoint you have in that controversy, of the pre preliminary ruling procedure of the European Court of Justice. And here, of course, our stories are uh, entangled. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to um, uh, introduce Mariana uh, uh, Peña Pinon, um, who is a PhD candidate uh, and a doctoral researcher um, here at the University of uh, uh, Luxembourg. And uh, then the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vosges, for this nice introduction. I would like to thank the Max Planck Institute, especially Professor Ruiz Fabris, uh, Lorenzo, and the organizing team for giving me this opportunity. Um, sorry, yes. uh, <clears throat> I am very happy to discuss with you my topic of the fiasco of the Mercosur advisory opinion mechanism. And uh, I will try to show you why this uh, great mechanism conceived to guarantee the uniform interpretation of Mercosur law is a backlash or a failure. For that, I will mention all the opinions rendered until today, which currently amount to three. So 15 minutes should be enough. I will first and briefly refer to the background of Mercosur and uh, the dispute resolution system before um, summarizing the legal framework of the advisory opinion mechanism. And the main part of the presentation will be focused on showing the failure of the mechanism and trying to explain the reasons for that. Replaying on the title of the conference, I will then refer to the illusions coming from the Argentinian practice, and I will conclude with some remarks. Sorry, I should put this. So the Mercosur was established in 1991 through the Treaty of Asunción, signed in um, 1991 by Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. But since 2012, Venezuela is also a full member of Mercosur. The aim of the treaty is to establish a common market, which shall involve, um, that was established in Article 1 of the treaty, free movements of goods, services, and factors of production between member states. To this day, um, Mercosur is only an incomplete custom union. The institutional structure was settled later in the Oro Preto Colo Pre uh, Oro Preto Protocol of 1994. The main organs are the Council, to, be sam to simplify the names, Council, the Group and the Trade Commissions, which adopt respectively decisions, resolutions and directives. These are secondary law instruments and the primary the primary law of the Mercosur is composed by the Treaty of Asunción, the Oro Preto, Pro, uh, Oro Preto Protocol, and some other protocols that have the, main, the same uh, uh, or legal order. The dispute resolution system. Well, the first uh, uh, system was foreseen in the Treaty of Asunción in Annex 3, and it was a temporary uh, system. It consisted of negotiations between uh, the, the member states, parties to a dispute, and include the potential uh, intervention of the group or the council, uh, which should give recommendations to the parties. By 1995, the member states should have adopted a permanent dispute 
settlement system that was included in Annex 3. Uh, but uh, even if the state had four years to establish this permanent system, they have adopted only a few months later, in 1991, the Protocol of Brasilia, which was into force for 10 years. The disputes between the states were settled by ad hoc tribu tribunals, settled up or by the member states on a case-by-case -case basis. In 2002, the member states adopted the Olivos Protocol, which is now into force. It creates the Permanent Review Court, but despite of the terminology, it did not create the permanent system. It is still pending. Now there's um, a project of the Parliament since 2010 to create the Mercosur Court of Justice. They take their time at the, in the Council. The Olivos Protocol was certainly an evolution of the system in many aspects, but it's still a system for resolving disputes between I'm sorry, between the member states of Mercosur with little um, access for uh, private parties. The, permanent, the, the, the main improvement is, of course, the creation of the Permanent Review Court, which is based in Asunción, that gives greater institutionalization to Mercosur. Here I would uh, like to point out that the Permanent Review Court is composed by five arbitrators that are not full-time judges they only need to be permanently available when a dispute arises. So arbitrators are exercising their own profession in the member states. <coughs> the, second improvement, I, I'm sorry. the second improvement of the Olivos Protocol is the provision for asking advisory opinions. This provision was viewed as a big step to enforce Mercosur law. Mercosur system finally has its own preliminary ruling procedure, yet very different in many aspects from the mechanism settled in the 267 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. This provision only stipulates that the Council may establish a mechanism for requesting advisory opinion. This was the only thing said in the Olios Protocol. So it was not until 2003, the next year, that the advisory opinion mechanism was regulated. The decision of the Council 37-2003 is the actual legal basis for requesting advice. The objective is to guarantee uniform application of Mercosur law. So different um, from the preliminary ruling procedures, the actors that can ask for uh, uh, an advice are the member states acting jointly the organs with decision-making capacity, and the Parlasur is not a decision-making capacity, that's why I add this organ, and the Supreme Courts of the Member States. So in this way, it's like a judicial dialogue as we know it in Europe. The procedure for requesting advice from national jurisdictions was settled by a 2007 decision of the Council. So even if this decision was adopted five years later, I, or after the Olivos Protocol, Article 1 stipulates that each Supreme Court shall adopt its own national procedure rules for requesting advisory opinions. The Supreme Courts of the four mem uh, founding states, meaning that Venezuela did uh, not yet do it, have uh, adopted this rule between 2007 and 2012. Coming to the legal framework of the mechanism, this legal framework can give some answer to the question of why national jurisdictions do not use more the mechanism. These answers are illustrated in points 1, 2, 5. These are um, all provisions of the regulation of the Libos Protocol, so in secondary law. But probably the main reasons are mistrust and ignorance. These are more rumors than <laughs> evidence, but mistrust in the Permanent Review Court because the arbiters are not uh, full-time judges, so uh, the, 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 the question is how the arbitrators can be in a strong position to explain to national judge how they have to resolve their dispute. And ignorance, probably, of Mercosur law in general and of this procedure to request advisory opinions, which imply to know the different steps they uh, needed to uh, regulate the mechanism. So coming to the legal framework, the most important uh, 
things I think that uh, don't allow for the mechanism to be uh, a success is the no, there's no obligation for national courts to ask for an advisory opinion, to request an advisory opinion, even when a question is raised in a case pending before a court of last instance, of course. It is not a direct dialogue. The national courts need to send the question through their Supreme Court. The response of the permanent review court is not binding for the national judge. This is important for the, to see the, the result of the advisory opinion that were request. The individuals and dissenting opinions are uh, allowed, and uh, this can be discussed as a um, benefit of the mechanism, but if we know that the uh, main purpose of the advisory opinion mechanism is to guarantee the uniform interpretation of Mercosur law, then having a whole series of possible interpretation of a law can be uh, against this purpose. And last, the cost of the proceedings that are paid by the member state of the national court requesting the opinion are not by all the member states together. So coming to the substance of the topic, the Permanent Review Court only rendered three advisory opinions to this day. The first came from a Paraguayan court and was asked before the Supreme Court has adopted the national rule to submit an advisory opinion. This was not an obstacle for the Permanent Review Court to uh, answer the question. The second and the third came from uh, Uruguayan courts and concerned the same subject, so we will talk about them jointly after. What is important to underline here is that none of the requesting court followed the reasoning of the Permanent Review Court. I will briefly refer to these cases. The dispute in the main proceeding of the first advisory opinion of 2007 referred to a Paraguayan company that sued an Argentinian company before the Paraguayan tribunals for contractual liability. The national law gives competence to Paraguayan uh, courts in contractual relations between firms established in, uh, abroad I'm sorry, and natural persons or legal persons based in Paraguay. The Argentinian company claimed lack of jurisdiction based on the contract between the parties because they had expressly chosen to submit themselves to the Argentinian courts. And this was in accordance with the Buenos Aires Protocol on International uh, Jurisdiction in Contractual Matters and Mercosur Instrument. So the national judge was wondering whether the uh, national the Paraguayan law was compatible with the Buenos Aires Protocol? Well, the answer was four different opinions, but written two main solutions. What did the permanent court say? The majority said that the Mercosur law was, um, th th uh, prevails over national law, so the Buenos Aires Protocol prevails over the, the Paraguayan law, but it also established that the national court should verify if the clause of jurisdiction was obtained in an abusive manner and if the clause is contrary or was contrary to the international public order. At the national level, the national judge um, declared itself incompetent and accepted the, that Mercosur law prevails over national law. But it made some uh, critics remark on the opinion by establishing that it did not share the solution of the majority about the validity of the jurisdictional clause. No provision in the Buenos Aires Protocol allowed for the requesting court to examine, ex examine the public order issues. So it, the judge did not follow the reasoning of the advisory opinion. In the second and the third advisory opinion, the plaintiffs were asking in the main procedures the, for the reimbursement of a tasa consular. This was a tax imposed upon goods coming from other member states. The plaintiff alleged that uh, this law was against Mercosur law. The question were, those I uh, put it in the slide, does the Mercosur law prevail over national law and which law should, apply, uh, should, uh, uh, should the national judge apply? And does the Mercosur law allow member states to re-establish taxes like the one at issue? Well, the uh, um, Permanent Review Court 
uh, start by reminding that the Mercosur law prevails over national law, but that it cannot determine on behalf of the national court which law should be applied. Fair enough, that happened also in Europe, but instead of guiding the national judge, as the ECJ does in a similar context, the, the Permanent Review Court established that it did not have all the information needed, in particular, in particular the nature of the tax of the Tasa Consular, is it a charge, the Permanent Review Court asked, or a fee corresponding to a cost of a service rendered and allowed by the treaty. So the Permanent Review Court uh, concludes that he can, it cannot give an answer, and it asks the national courts to qualify themselves the TASA Consular, and then to uh, request a new advisory opinion. What did the national courts do? Well, they both conclude that the TASA Consular was a charge and not a fee. But the tax was foreseen in a national law which was into force. And on the top of that, the national constitution does not allow a national judge to disapply national legislation. So, for the national judge, the Mercosur law cannot prevail over national legislation, and the tax was then uh, the, the law con uh, concerning the tax should be applied. So, turning on to the illusion of the mechanism, the Argentinian Supreme Court was about to ask uh, for an advisory opinion in several occasions. It was an illusion, at least for the scientific community, because the questions were withdrawn. The first time was in 1999, the Sankor case. The plaintiff, the Sankor company, which exports milk from Argentina to Paraguay, challenged the national legislation, a ministerial resolution, that fixed export duties for certain products, even when they are exported to other member states. The the sensitive question that uh, the Supreme Court of Argentina was uh, wondering to, to have an answer was, does the Treaty of Asunción prevent member states from imposing export duties on goods originated in one member state and bound for another member state? The outcome of the dispute in the national level was decided by the plaintiff, which withdrew the national action. So then the Supreme Court remove its request. This scenario was um, repeated uh, for at least uh, four times. The custom administration reached an agreement with the plaintiff between the time where the Supreme Court decided to request for an advisory opinion and the moment that the case was going to be sent, physically going to be sent to Asunción. At this stage, I really wonder if the Customs Administration was worried about what the Permanent Review Court would answer. In any case, the debate about the duties, um, the debate about the dispute on experts was resolved without dialogue, because in December 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that the export duties were compatible with the Treaty of Asunción. So to conclude, I think that advisory opinions, the advisory opinion mechanism is a great but unlikely useless tool. It took 10 years to complete the legal framework setting the procedure of the advisory opinion coming from national jurisdictions. The implementation of the procedure is clearly deficient. But if I may finish with a positive uh, sentence, I would say that the mechanism could be improved in an easy way by changing uh, secondary legislation, namely the decision of 2003, and probably and especially the article on the non-binding effects of the advisory opinion mechanism, and of course by making aware the, the national judge about Mercosur uh, law in general and about the procedure for requesting advisory opinions in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, and um, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm still wondering, though, if the fiasco terminology fits well. Also, 
you know, comparing to the history of the European Court of Justice and the, the, you know, the point of comparison that you actually yourself put in your own paper with the preliminary ruling, because when I think of the early years, and in a way, um, that's the early years also here of the advisory uh, opinion mechanism. We're really in the first decade. Um, you know, as the oral tradition says, you know, judges would actually open a bottle of champagne each time uh, the preliminary ruling uh, would come to, to Luxembourg. And also, there were so many disagreements with national Supreme Courts on uh, the contour, uh, the court which were actually allowed it to send preliminary rulings. Remember la théorie de l'acte clair in the uh, Conseil d'État, etc. So, I mean, it's not as if the, the preliminary ruling was a success from, from the start, and it took at least a decade before it really started to be, uh, um, you know, this powerful legal instrument for, uh, instrument for legal integration. But, I mean, this, so this, this is an ongoing um, 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 controversy, so I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, so now we, we're moving on to Constantinus uh, Magliveras, um, uh, and we're moving with, with your paper to, um, to the African continent. You, uh, you're a professor in the Department of Mediterranean Studies at the University of the Aegean. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much, the organizers, for their hospitality. I will start with an aphorism. On the whole, African states have an aversion towards international courts, even if these are pan-African courts. However, at an African sub-regional level, where regional economic integration organizations are active, in the African jargon they are called RECs, regional economic economic communities, the opposite is true. And this because these RECs have diligently followed the prototype of the European economic community, whose institutional architecture, as we all know, involved the Court of Justice with a very broad mandate. But these are courts principally supervising economic integration projects. They are not regional human rights courts. But it's possible that questions of a human rights nature will come before them. As we all know, courts usually tend to augment their mandate, and this would lead to their dealing with human rights issues if they choose this course of action. But if for whatever reason the membership of the international organization within which this judicial organ operates is not happy with the proactive court, trouble will ensue. And this is exactly what has happened with the Southern African Development Community, better known as SADEC, and its tribunal. It started operating in April 2007, and in November 2008, it gave judgment in the celebrate case of Campbell versus Zimbabwe which concerned expropriation of lands owned by white farmers in Zimbabwe. In that case, the tribunal identified four issues for adjudication. The first issue, did it have jurisdiction over the case? The second one, had the applicants, it was Mr. Campbell and another 77 applicants who joined later, have been denied court access in Zimbabwe. Third, had they been discriminated against on the grounds of race, they were white farmers. And fourth, were they entitled to receive compensation for the lands compulsory acquired by the Zimbabwean government? As regards the first issue, the tribunal answered it wearing the dress of a regional human rights court even though there is no SADEC protocol or other instrument on fun fundamental freedoms, the tribunal considered that it had jurisdiction in respect of any dispute concerning such matters. The second issue was also answered in the positive. Mr. Campbell and the other applicants had convinced it that they had suffered deprivation of lands over which they had property rights going back 100 years. Moreover, they had been unable to exercise the fundamental right of access to courts and the right to a fair hearing. 
As regards the third issue, the tribunal held that the violation of treatment meted out to applicants did constitute discrimination because the criteria employed were not reasonable and objective. On the contrary, they were arbitrary and based primarily on considerations of race. So if you like, what you had here is a case of a reserve apartheid. The fourth and final issue was also ruled against Zimbabwe. This was to be expected. It was a question of expropriation. After all, it's a well-developed rule in almost all parts of the world that a state may, expro may expropriate whatever it wants and wishes, provided that it pays adequate compensation to the rightful owners. Attempts to avoid paying compensation will usually fail before international courts, and this under the double protection of the right to property and the right not to be subjected to discrimination. In August 2010, the summit of heads of state and government of SADC, the highest ranking organ in the organization, decided to effectively suspend the tribunal's operation and to have a new protocol of the tribunal drafted. This was adopted in 2014, but to the best of my knowledge, it has not been signed by any member state yet. What led SADC, SADC leaders to suspend the tribunal's operation? I have identified two reasons. The first reason, they did not like at all the idea that the tribunal was becoming a SADC court of human rights, passing judgment on whether domestic laws and policies are or are not in compliance with human rights norms, and even worse, whether they breach human rights norms. It was clear from the judgment in Campbell, but also from other judgments, that the bench of the tribunal would collide not only with member states, but also with other SADC organs. The second reason I have identified SADC leaders have always shown solidarity, alliance, friendship with Robert Mugabe. This is the man who has effectively run Zimbabwe since independence in 1980. From a European perspective, this could be difficult to comprehend. But Mugabe is a figurehead in Southern Africa and more generally in Africa. He's 90 years old currently in his fifth terms in office as president. He is the person who stood up to the white supremacists, the person who signed the death certificate of the white South Rhodesia. Now, based on these two considerations, I think that it should be argued that the SADC Treaty never endowed the tribunal with a human rights mandate. Presumably, the drafters of the SADC Treaty did, need, did not even consider that the tribunal could have had such jurisdiction. This is a general proposition applying to courts of justice operating as the juridical organs in the regional economic integration organizations, they are not competent to rule on matters pertaining to human rights unless the member states themselves have expressly authorized them. As it concerns Rex, arguably this is true only in the case of ECOVAS. ECOVAS is the economic community of Western African states. On the basis of amendments adopted in 2005, its Court of Justice has jurisdiction to determine cases of violation of human rights that occur in any member state. When the SADC tribunal was asked to deal with cases where it did not have expressed jurisdiction to examine and rule of them, it chose to interpret the SADC treaty as well as its own mandate and competencies in a way which is resulting in holding that it could adjudicate matters falling into the ambit of domestic constitutional law and allegations of human rights abuses. It is argued in the paper that 
because of the circumstances in the Campbell versus Zimbabwe case, the tribunal presumably decided that it had to be bold and collide head-on with the respondent member state, that is Zimbabwe. However, it was clear that Zimbabwe would not tolerate its expansive operation. But the tribunal pressed on, and when Zimbabwe failed to give effect to its judgment, as it should have done, the tribunal reported to the summit for contempt of court and asked for action to be ordered against Zimbabwe. Such action was never taken. Should the Sadek Tribunal be more reserved? Should it have adopted a more progressive stance instead of immediate collision? Should it have developed its case law on human rights over a much longer period of time in the hope that those member states, few as they may be, which subscribe to the rule of law and honor human rights would have become its ally? In short, should the tribunal have played judiciary politics so as to consolidate its position in the SADC region and commands everybody the respect, as arguably the European Court of Justice has done. Notwithstanding whatever fault one might find in how the tribunal handled, handled Michael Campbell versus Zimbabwe and other similar cases, the member states of SADC and personally the leaders must be faulted even more. If for no other reason, because they confirm what very bravely, the Constitutional Court of South Africa has said, Africa is the dark continent with little regard for human rights and the rule of law. Sadek leaders treated the tribunal as the enemy and contained it by effectively suspending its operation ad infinitum. As has been noted earlier, a new tribunal protocol was signed two years ago, but it is unknown whether it will ever enter into force. Clearly, SADC member states are in no hurry to make it operative again. Perhaps they still regard the tribunal as the enemy, but the, tribu but the tribunal is not the enemy. On the contrary, it is the inherent ethos of impunity the misplaced idea that no one can be arbiter of what SADC member states do or what they fail to do, the inability to behave as modern states and to grasp prevailing realities all over the world. As is often the case, those who bear the consequences of such actions and inaction are the populations of member states which are left without any real protection. As has been argued in, the, in this paper, in matters affecting the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms, the judicial organs of Rex are not the appropriate bodies to deal with them, unless there exists an express authorization to do so. And at the same time, there does exist a regional human rights court this is the African Court of Justice, uh, sorry, the African Court of Human, of, of Human and People's Rights, which in the meantime has become part of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights, it's rather complicated. But there are substantive and procedural obstacles preventing private persons from lodging their complaints and seeking justice. Please allow me to conclude my paper by citing an extract from a judgment handed down by the South African Constitutional Court, which I think summarizes the situation perfectly. The court said, and I quote, for the right or wrong reasons, or a combination of both, Africa has come to be known particularly by the Western world as the dark continent a continent which has little regard for human rights, the rule of law, and good governance. Apparently, driven by a strong desire to contribute positively to the renaissance of Africa, to set its southern region of this development inhibiting negative image, to coordinate and to give impetus to regional development, 
Southern African states established, established SADC with special emphasis on, among other things, the need to respect, protect, and promote human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. So um, now we're moving to you, um, Evelyn uh, Mojiri. Uh, Evelyn, you're a PhD candidate um, uh, at the, in public international law um, at the University of Cape Town, and you're uh, here a research uh, fellow at the Max Planck um, Institute. And you're uh, now presenting um, a paper that gets us to East Africa and a variety at least, I think, three enterprises' experiments in um, sub-regional uh, adjudication and uh, with a view of comparing their uh, related uh, performance. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the Institute and our director also the organizers of the event for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. So the, the sorry, I'm just going to, yeah. So the institutions that I want to talk about today belong to uh, an organization, the East African Community, which was the first real attempt at regional integration in the region after colonialism, or really ever. And the institutions, I found them very interesting just because they had a very peculiar structure, or at least I think an, an uncommon structure. And in the context of the theme of this conference, I think they'll also make an interesting study because they, share, they have a shared historical context in that they belong to the same um, organization. Thank you. <laughs> uh, they belong to the same organization, and yet uh, they perform very differently within this organization. They're also very different from each other, both structurally, um, in terms of their genesis also, and, and their functions within this organization. Um, so they provide material for making what really are educated guesses about what may have caused one institution to, to fail, where others um, did not. Um, they also have a common um, failure in the sense that they failed together when the community collapsed. And I'm reminded of a, a phrase I had yesterday, uh, the failure to survive. So these two failures, uh, so these two senses of failure, the failure to perform, to function properly within the organization and the, and the collapse or the failure to survive, for, together from the theme of my own presentation, uh, which shall proceed as follows. I'm going to introduce the community and the courts to you. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about these two failures that I've just mentioned. And if there is time, I'm going to try and relate them to the current East African community because there are two, there's another one that's going on right now, and its judicial institution, just to see if the experience of the old um, institutions informed in any way the formation and the operation of the current uh, institution. So the old East African community was created um, through the Treaty of Cooperation of 1967. It comprised three countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Both of the, all three uh, shared a common history uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the sense that they were administered by Great Britain, all three of them. And there's, a, there's lots to say about the history behind uh, regional integration in general, so I, I can't get into it right now in this uh, conference, but I'm just going to mention um, the fact that it was preceded by two organizations. The East African High Commission was a colonial um, enterprise, and, uh, which, uh, was, uh, and then the second organization was the Common Services Organization, which took over common services that were administered uh, to all three regions uh, by the High Commission. So the East African community took over these uh, common services in 1967, and on top of it added a common market. The other important thing to mention about the background is that the East African community was a compromise. Um, Kenya, and Uga Kenya and Tanzania wanted an East African federation, a complete uh, political integration, but Uganda was reluctant. So the East African community represents the limits um, to which Uganda was willing to integrate with the others or to cede uh, its sovereignty to a regional organization. Um, so the features, I'm just going to put all three on the slide there. Okay, so the features of the East African com uh, Community Organization, uh, those, um, okay, 
The first part is that there are two areas of cooperation. What I've already mentioned, common services. These were things like um, uh, aviation, rail and harbors, uh, higher education, uh, post and telecommunication, things like that, that were run uh, together as, through uh, East African regional institutions. And there was also the common market. And then there were, it, there were very, very many, many institutions. Those are complex web of institutions that could be grouped in the six, uh, in the six categories that I've put on the slide. And all the institutions fell somewhere between two levels of cooperation. The first one is the technical cooperation, which is basically a, a way of sharing uh, personnel, expertise, uh, costs, and, and to jointly on assets. Its purpose really is just efficiency and things like that. And then there was the integration level, which involved um, coordination of policy, uh, important things important policies that would affect the three states and, and to coordinate them at a regional level through a powerful regional organizations. So the, the main distinction to make between these two is that the first one did not involve any session of uh, sovereignty, while the second one um, did. And the tribunals um, fell uh, in different uh, levels, as we shall see. So, I'm sorry, this isn't working. Oh yeah, uh, so these are the three courts the Court of Appeal, the Common Market Tribunal, and the Industrial Court. Uh, the East African Court of Appeal background, it was the oldest of the three courts. It was started by the British in 1902. It was a colonial supranational institution in the sense that it served different colonies and protectorates and uh, mandates uh, of Great Britain in, Eastern, in the Eastern region and beyond, in the, East Africa, in the Eastern African region and beyond, sorry. And it was brought into the predecessor predecessor organization of the EAC, which was the EACSO, which I've already talked about, in 1961, during the decolonization period. And later, it was taken over by the EAC in 1967. Um, its key features, I, within the organization of the community, it was really a technical cooperation. It had no function in the day-to-day -day functioning of the East African community. It was really just a product of that cooperation. Um, it was also a shared or common service in the sense that it provided services that would have, would, would have to be provided anyway. So the, the, it provided services to each of the three um, states, which, which would have been provided through some other means. Um, the, its jurisdiction, it was the final court of appeal um, it had essentially the same kind of uh, jurisdiction as normal uh, courts of appeal, national courts of appeal usually have. So it typically had um, compl the disputes from residents or nationals, natural persons mostly. And uh, its disputes were involved uh, its disputes also were not allowed to, it was not uh, given jurisdiction over the interpretation of the constitutions of the three states. Um, uh, its applicable law also was the municipal uh, law, again, not including the constitutions, so which led to a very interesting um, uh, scenario where the highest court, the one with the final appellate, uh, the one with the final, the, the, one with the, the, court, the highest court with the power of precedent was not allowed to interpret the highest laws of the three states. And its composition, uh, which as we shall see later is important, was the superior courts of municipal systems. So these were people who had the highest uh, legal qualifications. Uh, the East African Common Market Tribunal was uh, entirely different. It was an entirely new uh, court. It <coughs> It, were, it came along with the common market, which I've mentioned was entirely new um, in the region. Its, um, its key features, sorry, I'm just going to put all of that there. Okay, so its key features um, in the region, it was located in the integration level. So, and obviously it's, the, the area of cooperation was the common market, and it was basically the only true uh, international court in the traditional sense that we understand international courts among the three, the three tribunals that I'm talking about. Its jurisdiction was uh, what I'm calling quasi-appellate, and this is just because um, it had 
because of its relationship to the institution that I've put up there called the Common Market Council, this was composed of ministers who resolved disputes politically, but they also had a judicial function in the sense that whenever there was a complaint that touched upon the treaty provisions that regarded the, com the common market, this body had the power to determine that there had been a breach and to then um, issue uh, remedial measures in a binding decision. So from this decision, there was uh, a right of appeal to the... To the, to the tribunal. So I'm calling it because I appeal it just because this other institution was not a tribunal. So in a sense, this may have actually best just, it may have actually just performed the function of a, this could be seen as a court of first instance in a sense because this other one was not really a court. Um, it also had interstate disputes involving the common market and advisory opinions on the law of the common market that it would receive from the common market council. Um, so you can, you can see that its entire um, competence had to do with the common market. It was not a guardian of the treaty, just the provisions that had to do with the common market. The applicable law yeah, was those treaties, and its composition, we can see very different from the uh, Court of Appeal, um, was peculiar. The chairman was the only one who was required to have a professional legal qualification professional legal qualifications. The other four were expected to be experts from the areas of industry, commerce, and public affairs. So I think this is just a very you know, peculiar feature. So the industrial court, um, at the background to it is in, in the proceed in the in the in the, in the, in the community's predecessor organization, as the labor disputes involving it, the staff of the organization had been dealt with in the municipal uh, system. This was essentially retained, but the community added, created a new tribunal composed of uh, heads of the labor courts of each three, all, all three courts. So they would travel to each state, listening to uh, disputes from nationals who belong to each state, who are uh, the staff of the community. So its key features as I've mentioned, okay, within the locus of the EAC, it was a technical cooperation. It did have some uh, function in the day-to-day -day running of the, of the community, but it was very, very minimal. Okay, thank you. Uh, but it, um, it also provided a common service, its jurisdiction, well, as mentioned, okay, I have five minutes, I'm just going to go right ahead. Uh, so the applicable law was the municipal labor laws, heads of, and, and its composition was as I've mentioned. Um, so the relationship between the three was that it, in, in the treaty, there are really parallel institutions, but through a decision of the Court of Appeal, um, the industrial court was deemed to be a part of the municipal um, so the two ways of failing um, that I spoke about earlier. First, I'm going to compare uh, the performances. So the courts performed very differently in terms of workload. The tribunal only had two uh, references of cases made to it within the entire 10 years. Um, in comparison, the Court of Appeal had hundreds of cases, as well as the industrial court. The operations were also very differently. In the 10 years of the treaty, the tribunal never actually fully operationalized. So why is this? I'm just going to like, uh, uh, I'm going to, first I'm going to, come to oh, I'm sorry, first I'm going to, I'm going to compare uh, the features that I've just described of the court. So there was a difference in the startup challenges. The Court of Appeal and the Industrial Court performed seamlessly throughout the rest of the community. The tribunal took very long to start up and never, was never fully operationalized. Differences in, in the level of internationalization. The Court of Appeal and the Industrial Court were really municipal institutions, as I've just described, even though they were set up under the aegis of the, a, of the EAC, whereas the tribunal was a classical, a traditional court. Um, the primary content was also very different. The Court of Appeal had mostly natural, uh, had disputes for mostly natural persons, as, was the, as did the I see, and the, the tribunal only had uh, disputes from the three states, not even the community or its institutions could appear before it. Uh, difference in the level of cooperation and difference in the level of judici judicialization. So the findings, um, which I, of course we cannot speak in absolute, say these are just correlations, what I think are possible uh, reasons for this uh, difference in performance. Um, the more the more useful these institutions were to the, to the immediate needs of the 
different uh, states, the, the better they performed in the community, the better the infrastructural support they received in terms of existing um, mechanisms, uh, the better they performed. Um, the, relative, the more removed they were from both the common market and the international or integration level, the better they performed. And the more open they were to private actors, the better they performed. Um, so this reveals what attitudes of the three states. Uh, I think and there was a tendency away from judicialization, and this persists even to this day. In African states in particular are reluctant to resolve the disputes through regional bodies. And so the, the, court, the international tribunal really had a very, very small case. So only three states which were not even willing to... to to litigate um, their disputes. And then it also reveals a tendency away from integration in the sense that they were not willing to cede their sovereignty to regional um, institutional, to a regional judicial body in particular. Um, sorry. Okay. So um, the second failure, the total collapse. Uh, so of course, the cause is here is very simple. It was the, the three states stopped functioning when the organization stopped functioning. So there were casualties of the inability of those three states to agree. Um, it was, this collapse happened um, first in a very disorganized manner. Um, there had been uh, really tensions that were building up until 1977 between leaders of the three states and uh, in one day, uh, President Nyerere just shut down the border between Tanzania and Kenya, and each state took over the assets of the community that belonged to it, and since then, uh, basically, they stopped talking. And then for the next few years, the, the hostility just um, grew to a ridiculous level. And then in 1984, they came together to sign a mediation agreement to share the assets. So I'm calling it the formal dissolution because they agreed uh, formally that the you know, the community was over, they, they shared the assets and the liabilities, and they set a uh, basis for future um, cooperation. Um, so why it happened, many reasons have been noted. Um, economic imbalance, Kenya had been a little bit more developed than the industrially by the British than the other two. Um, the personality clashes between the leaders, particularly after Idi Amin over overthrew William Obote, uh, who was a friend of the presidents of Kenya and Uganda, and after that they basically just could not have a conversation, and, they, and so they could not direct the authority, the executive body of the organization, they could, not, they could not build a consensus in terms of policy, and gradually the institution fell. There were ideological differences, Tanzania was socialist, Kenya was um, capitalist, Tanzania was non-aligned, Kenya was leaned more towards the US, and then there was, in general, a lack of pot political uh, will. <laughs> okay, so um, lessons uh, for the ECJ, the current uh, constitutions, I mean, I don't know. The, oh gosh. <laughs> the revival of the East African uh, community happened over 20 years of gradual um, uh, re-establishment of communications and setting up of commissions to, to study the possibility of cooperation. Eventually, we succeeded in the setting up of the, uh, the, in 2000, of the current East African community. So I think that it was possible just because there had been a change of circumstances. The ideological differences had disappeared after the end of the Cold War. The personality clashes were no longer relevant. All of the presidents who had uh, presided over the first community were just no longer there. And then the commitment to economic balancing was a little bit better. Kenya was more open to making more sacrifices to make uh, this possible. And the there, there is a renewed political will, but at the same time, new challenges. Um, Regarding other prospects, for example, Tanzania is a member of SADC, and there's the tensions about whether it is much more uh, loyal to SADC than it is to EAC. And oh yeah, and so for the court itself, what is new? It is a completely different um, setup. There is no court of appeal equivalent. The functions of the industrial court have been joined, have been given to the current tribunal, which is the EACJ. It has a very expanded um, jurisdiction and clientele. Basically, anybody can go to this court to complain about any breach of the treaty or, it, or East African uh, legislations. And uh, the court is the guardian of the treaty as a whole, not just portions of the treaty. It has a very traditional composition. Um, 
uh, it is this applicable law is entire is, is is the treaty plus others. Uh, oh, and international law. So there's there's more clarity there, and it has a much better performance than the tribunal. Can you can you conclude? Because there's if we want to have the debate and before the lunch table. No, no, okay. just, just take. Okay, so it's just concluding that, remarks. This, yeah. But, okay. But if you want. So prospect. Okay. So was was this setup influenced by the old experience? Um, I don't know. It may just have been experienced by the the the, 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 the regional the different the success stories of regional uh, corporations. Um, I mean, you can take the EAC was revived, but its judicial structure was not. So it may be that it's because you know it was deemed unworkable completely. So yeah, we may say that. Lessons were learned from that experience. Um, there's still a tendency towards against uh, judicialization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry I pushed you, but um, we we have um, we're running late. Actually, we started I think 20 minutes later, so I guess we can have uh, 20 minutes. Um, on the lunch break, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I will uh, resist the temptation to make remarks, although I very much enjoyed it and I'm particularly interested in also in the last paper on the colonial heritage. And, um, but I will move immediately to the, um, to the discussion and take um, four or five questions if there are. There I see one here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Aldo Zamit Bordang Laraskin. Um, in the past, in the ages of the Commonwealth Secretariat, I um, was able to meet with the Registrar of Sadak and some of the um, judges just after the Mike Campbell and others' judgment had been delivered. And what I have here is a very brief snippet, curiosity, and then a short question. Um, when the Attorney General of Zimbabwe was asked to appear before the Sadak Tribunal to answer for, at the time, alleged violations of um, human rights in, in Zimbabwe. The address um, the uh, Attorney General had to go to, and this is interesting for those of us who had these discussions about the ebbs and flows of history yesterday, was Sadak Tribunal, um, Mugabe Avenue, Windhoek, Namibia. Um, one, that was the snippet. Now the question is one of the arguments put forward by the Sadek Tribunal uh, to adjudicate on this question was that you cannot have serious uh, economic or regional integration unless you have at least a very basic regard to some form of human rights, including the right to compensation after expropriation. So, I would like to ask Konstantinos, to what extent do you engage with that argument? Or perhaps to reframe it in what we spoke about yesterday, um, to what extent is the failure of Sadak the attributable to the judges and the tribunal? And to what extent is the failure attributable to the politicians and the leaders of the area? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ari, here, here. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe linking up with the previous, uh, also to Professor Magliveras. Um, thank you for your your paper. Thanks to all of you for your your papers. Um, there's a tempting point here for comparison with the EU, um, as you mentioned. Indeed, human rights not being in the SADC uh, treaty or, or court jurisdiction, at least formally, um, and um, that perhaps would have needed to be more explicit, but of course neither uh, was it in the EU, and uh, you had a legendary case law, of course, in which the uh, whole unwritten catalogue of fundamental rights was developed, and protection offered to individuals um, in need, and actually already um, the court of the European communities, which was predominantly the economic community still, um, did so. So there indeed the need for it being explicit Maybe you could question that, and, and um, with regard to the, also the previous question, of course, expropriation in itself, um, is it not also in part, or even predominantly actually an economic rights issue um, appropriate to deal with uh, for a court of a development community? So not just entirely a human right in a league of its own, 
but also as in the sense of, well, with investment courts we talked about yesterday, you could say that at least partly um, expropriation as an issue um, could be placed in the remit um, of the court without calling that an expansion or any kind of, um, um, yeah, uh, some kind of power grab in itself. And then lastly, just an observation, um, also a bit of name dropping uh, alert, but uh, Dark Continent. Uh, um, it's of course, actually the, the label which Mark Mazauer uh, applied to, to Europe uh, in the past century rather than Africa. So actually Africa still is what Europe was, maybe. Um, what Europe was, lest we forget. Thank you very much. Did you, you wanted to talk, raise a question? Yes. It work. My question also goes to the problem of the SATC tribunals, the MIS. Um, should I change it? I think it doesn't work, yeah. Yeah, I also want to refer to the SATC tribunal and its attitude, proactive attitude. In fact, there is a very clear textual basis in the, in the treaty that the tribunal refers to. So maybe the option would have been not to include the reference to human rights in the treaty itself, although only in a form of principle. Uh, if the governments of the affected con interested countries really didn't want the tribunal not to get into that issue. At the same time, we have a history telling us that, for instance, even the European uh, Court of Justice at the time did get into the issue of human rights upon a specific indication of national constitutional courts that it should engage with human rights in a way. So the, the input came from national levels that the Court of Justice should engage in a way or the other with human rights. And also the case of the ECOWAS Court you mentioned is also telling the ECOWAS Court at first decided that it was not in a position to adjudicate human rights cases and then came the political backing. So it's really very difficult to say what is best because now we do not have a court working for the SATC community. Uh, whereas uh, the ECOWAS court is working and has adjudicated on rather interesting and important human rights cases. So I understand the problem of a judicial integrity. In a way, I feel reading the Campbell judgment that there is a matter of judicial integrity on of judges' understanding of the judicial function as not po uh, uh, in the sense that it is not possible to detach it from hu a human rights perspective. At the same time, maybe... Uh, waiting for political developments could have been uh, wiser, in a sense. I understand your argument, I also back it, but this consideration that you need political backing in order to go forward is something that tribunals cannot uh, forget. I would like to have your reactions on this. Okay. Oh, there are two more questions. Maybe if you can make your questions brief, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the three panelists for, for exciting papers. Uh, my question is to Evelyn about, um, you said that the, from your study, your conclusion is that there is a, reluction, a reluctance from African, uh, African uh, states, Eastern African states, to resolve their, um, their disputes regionally. They prefer sort of a state approach. Um, no, maybe perhaps I didn't, then you could clarify. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights and the, the relatively new jurisdiction um, over international courts, a, a little bit as a reaction to the International Qu Criminal Court, perhaps. So my question is whether you are looking at that as a phenomenon for regional, um, sort of regional, um, the, the, the contrary of reluctance, yeah? the, the, the opening up to regional uh, solutions as a response to international uh, presence, perhaps, as an incentive. Thank you very much. Uh, Heno Kasmelaj from the Max Planck Institute here. Uh, my question is related to the uh, SADC tribunal. Uh, I think the political factors are important uh, uh, factor in, in contributing to the demise of the tribunal. But at the same time, by focusing and confining the discussion on the tribunal only to the political factors, I think uh, we may uh, run the risk of over emphasizing or over politicizing the issue and ignoring the legal uh, factors which have actually contributed to the, the uh, 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 demise of, of the uh, tribunal. And because if you, yeah, if you look at back the uh, arguments uh, raised by Zimbabwe, there are important issues uh, regarding the establishment 
of the tribunal between the protocol and the TADEC treaty, which are not clear in terms of the, the uh, mandate, but not only on the mandate, but also on the establishment itself, because the establishment requires a signature by member countries as well as ratification. Whereas, the Mwabe was making a point that this has not been done according to the rules. So there are legal discussions. I think uh, Lauren Bartels of, of the uh, Cambridge has also discussed these issues and read there are elements which actually uh, help Zimbabwe to raise issues regarding the, the uh, existence of the court itself because it was established on a flawed legal grounds if you want to look at it from the perspective of Zimbabwe. And, and uh, you also see that Zimbabwe actually didn't just simply out of the blue say that we do not recognize the court for political reason. Zimbabwe argued based on law. They mentioned the Sadiq Treaty, they mentioned the protocol, and they tried to uh, argue that actually the establishment of the Sadiq Tribunal from the outset was not a correct or was not then according to the law. So if we just only emphasize on the politics, of course I agree that the politics matter more than the law, but at the same time this should not be done at the risk of uh, uh, the, the uh, important issues, legal issues, which are involved in the case. Thank you. Maybe, um, I think we'll have just one round of questions to, um, if there are more. Um, no, no, particularly. I actually have one for you, Evelyn, and um, uh, because I think your paper talks very nicely uh, with uh, Andre's paper earlier, um, where he, uh, for various different reasons, but he, you know, it's con the contradiction that he identifies um, within uh, Central Am Latin American um, judicial, uh, you know, experiments between you know, this political unity paradigm and international law project. And here in that case, in your case, I see you know, still, of course, the regional and international law uh, paradigm and you know, the contradiction with uh, something that is an, uh, a legacy from the colonial uh, rule, because in a way, what is the unity of this regional um, uh, area, if not London, in a way, historically. And uh, in your paper, there's a, an interesting part where you show that, you know, initially, um, this Eastern African court didn't find judges and had to recourse to uh, British judges uh, in its early years, and Nauta Park, famously, <laughs> uh, because in lack of, uh, actually, a, a legal community at this uh, regional level. So I think, you know, I wanted to hear you maybe about this, um, you know, the part of this legacy in the failure uh, to, uh, of this, uh, or the difficulties of this court. Um, so maybe um, we can um, move on to, do you want to get to some of the remarks and extend them to your own uh, uh, case, because I think they all... Maybe I just comment on what you said after yeah. my presentation about the ECJ celebrating the each preliminary ruling coming to Luxembourg. Um, I, I, I agree that the preliminary ruling uh, reference was also uh, problematic to be settled in Europe. I agree with that. But I think that the problem for the advisory opinion mechanism, it's, uh, it's not only a question of a matter of time. I think that the problem is um, settled in the way that uh, the, the, the um, law uh, treats the advisory opinion. And I don't think the decision of 2003 would uh, lead to a development of Mercosur law. It's, it's not a matter of time. It's not a matter only to, um, uh, I, I don't like to say the educate judges, but to, to, to make aware judges of the Mercosur law and uh, to... Um, uh, encouraged to ask advisory opinions. I think probably they, they need to change the secondary law of the mechanism to, to be more a succeed. Uh, probably, of course, this is not so easy and this is uh, originating political reasons. Uh, the the um, regulation of the advisory opinions coming through the national jurisdiction takes five years to be adopted and uh, it was adopted 
probably because they introduced the clause of the non-binding effects. So, well, this is okay, not Okay, so no prospect of a champagne. Uh <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay. Maybe you. we'll have a court of justice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Constantino, do you want to Well, by taking up the final question, if you want to get to the nitty-gritty, the little technicalities of the creation of the Sadek Tribunal, it was a mess. Okay? So I wonder if the Mugabe regime would have answered these technical problems about the tribunal's establishment if the court had not ruled against the Zimbabwe government's tactics. So if you want to go down to the nitty-gritty, we go down to the nitty-gritty. As you probably know, once the tribunal had been adopted, but not entered into force, it was amended. This is unheard of in public international law. It is unheard of in public international law and the law of treaties to amend a treaty which has not entered into force already. What about this law? Lots of law of the sea treaty has been amended yeah. before it entered into force. So Not that, yeah. if you have a protocol to a treaty. Is this different? It's different to have a treaty which was negotiated from the beginning, and it's different to have a protocol whose legal basis is the treaty established in SADC. And this is what has happened in the African Union as well, with the African Court of Just Human Rights and the Section of International Criminal Law. Okay? But when the African, when the SADC leaders decided to suspend, effectively suspend the tribunal's operation, was that legal what they did? Was that within the SADC? way of operating? How do you prohibit a court to hear new cases? How do you prohibit the court, which was never dissolved, officially the court has, uh, the tribunal, I'm sorry, has never been officially dissolved. It's sti it is still possible to revamp it if SADC leaders decide to appoint new judges. So, how do you do that? Is that legal? And regarding the, the question about politics and uh, law, well, Sadek leaders have always supported Mugabe personally, him personally. When Zimbabwe was suspended from the Commonwealth of Nations, and Zimbabwe withdrew from the Commonwealth of Nations as a reaction to its suspension, it was only Sadek leaders that stood up and said, no, this is a wrong decision. But it was not a wrong decision when 1995 Nigeria was suspended from the Commonwealth of Nations. I see double standards here. I see double standards in favor of Mugabe and his regime and against everybody else. But it is true that the SADC Tribunal is not the only case of a REC, Regional Economic Community, Court of Justice, that has had classes with member states. The East African community that Evelyn talked about had similar problems. Why? Because in 2007, it ruled that Kenya had not followed the rules in appointing the members of the Kenyan delegation to the East African Legislative Assembly. This is, as you may know or may not know, the uh, organ representing member states at the uh, parliamentary level. And what did member states do at the instigation of Kenya? And they did that even before the final judgment was issued. They did that after the interim ruling judgment was issued. At the instigation of Kenya, within weeks, they decided to amend the Eastern European Community Treaty and downsize the court's mandate in terms of reference. And when an NGO, the East African Legal Society, challenged the validity of these treaty amendments, 
the East African Tribunal said, no, these amendments were correctly negotiated, adopted, and implemented. We wished it were different, but they were correctly. So the judges themselves, the bench in the East African community, themselves accepted the downsizing of the role, but they were given the opportunity to do that. The SADEC tribunal bench was never given the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Evelyn? Um, thank you for your questions. Um, on the, the questions that you asked me, um, the, the, the a clarification, when I was talking about the tendency away from judicialization or the reluctance to judicialize at a regional level, I was, I was contrasting it to a preference for political uh, means of uh, judicialization. I wasn't talking about a, a reluctance to international courts um, in general. Um, the second thing about the opening up of regional um, tribunals in response to the ICC, um, I'm going to say yes, I agree uh, with what you said, that yeah, the ICC is uh, influential in getting Africans to uh, but particularly the cases against the Kenyan president and the deputy president of the ICC have, been, have contributed to this, uh, looking towards a, 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 a continental uh, basis of, of, of dealing with international crimes. But no, I did not look at that in my study. It was very specific. It had to do with the historical uh, organization that I talked about. And um, with regards to your questions, I hope I understood them. Um, but yeah, I, in my paper, I did not get into it in my presentation, but um, I did talk about uh, this, the number one, the structural difficulties. Uh, uh, when they decided to set up a brand new tribunal at the regional level, and I questioned whether it might have been better for them to just expand the jurisdiction of the existing court, the Court of Appeal, rather than to you know, to begin this work of creating a brand new court from scratch. And I think you're right that it did contribute to the failures in the sense that it took forever for them to agree on a chairman. Um, so yes, and the second thing about the, 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 I think what you're talking about, the colonial experience, was I talked about the, the choice of a collective identity, basically the, that, that faced the East African leadership after the end of colonization, because historically the, there was no East African um, identity. Um, the only historical basis of, of a collective identity were the old uh, indigenous polities, which had been converted into simple ethnicities, you know, the tribes or the ethnic communities of the region. And of course, these are just too small uh, to form uh, a basis for a regional uh, entity, and there was also there was also another basis of identity which was a much wider one, not does not subregional in South Africa, but on the continental level, which was based on the common experience of Africans of uh, European um, uh, colonization, a sense of an oppressed people. So yeah, that I think that was a challenge in uh, setting up the, the East African community. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think um, um, I would like to thank you uh, for your papers and for your uh, the, the very nice discussion. I think I have learned a lot so, uh, today, uh, this morning. Um, so thank you very much for, for that. But I think now it kind of has become urgent that we move on to to the lunch. So to the lunch. Then. So as uh, yesterday, it will be in the ground floor. And uh, I propose that we resume our meeting at 2. So you have a bit more than one hour and 15 minutes to, to have lunch downstairs. Thank you very much and, uh, to the panelists. <laughs>